Now this morning we're going to be in the book of John, fourth book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 20, verses 24 through 31. So um, as you're getting there, I, I wanted to just step aside for a moment and, and address one of the uh, current news issues that has come up recently. If you notice, and I'm sure as many of you have, I've been very quiet about it on Facebook, which I'm not usually. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that was the, the overturning of the Supreme Court decision of Roe versus Wade. All right. Yeah. yeah. I know most evangelical Christians were happy to hear about this, but I also want to understand that I have some very strong opinions about it that I wanted to share that I think are biblically based. And one of them is I'm very sad that this has become such a political issue. Um, this is something that is not political at all. And secondly, and, and I was, and I've preached about this many times even prior to this decision, uh, 20 years ago I started preaching on this, is that I, I'm very concerned that Christians tended to have more concern for the unborn than the born. Mm. And it's not something, it's something that actually has started to come up and we've been accused of by, um, by non-Christians that Christians are now gloating, that they're happy that there are all these ramifications are going to occur. And, and make no mistake about it, there will be a lot of ramifications. And there will be a lot of need that will rise up in the community. Um, first and foremost, there's a lot of anger that is going to continue to threaten to divide and, and separate and make Christians look like we are antagonistic and that we are mean, that we are evil, and that, and again, Satan is going to do everything he can to fan the flames of that. We as Christians are now being called upon more than ever to reach out to young pregnant women and older pregnant women in need. We need to reach out and show love, kindness, help, assistance, exactly as Jesus has directed us to. Amen. Amen. So if you've heard the story but many years ago, I went to uh, another, like another church and I got there just as they were planning an abortion clinic protest. And they sort of put me on the spot and wanted me to drive them down to Pittsburgh and also take part in it. And I asked them, I said, if you're going to do this, I said, there's a lot of things that we must do. One is, nobody's going to stand there and scream hate-filled messages that scare young girls and claim to be Christians. We won't do that as part of God's people. Amen. Amen. And if none of you, every single one of you, must be prepared, if that girl turns around and says to you, look, what am I supposed to do? I don't know where the father is. My parents have thrown me out. I'm 16 years old. I don't have an education. I have no way to take care of myself or this baby. If you are not willing to take that girl into your home, help her with her medical expenses, her physical expenses, her adoption expenses, her emotional needs, and if you're not willing to do all of that, then you do not need to be standing in front of that clinic. Amen. No matter what we do, we are representing the kingdom of God. Absolutely. Amen. We are representing God's love, God's kindness, and everything we do that has to do with this decision. Every comment we make, every post that we put on Facebook, any social media interaction that we have at all, must reflect the love of God. Amen. Amen. Okay. I hope everybody's in agreement with that. Yeah. Let's have a prayer for what's going on right now, okay? Our dear Heavenly Father, God, we pray for our country. Lord, we pray for all those who are in need. Lord, we pray for just this, this plethora of emotions and issues. And Lord, this was such, so far away from a black and white issue. There are just so many different components of this. And Lord, Throughout history, you have called upon your church to rise up and your church to represent your kingdom in times of need, in the times of division in our country. I pray, Lord, that you will use your church to heal this country, to help those, Lord, who are scared, to help those who are in need, 
to not be seen as evil people making decisions for others with no concern for consequences. Dear Lord, we need your guidance now more than ever. We need your love. We need your help. And Lord, so many people are so scared and so angry and confused. And none of those three things have anything to do with you. So we pray, dear God, that, that you are not the God who excuses anger and you're not the God of confusion. And you tell us so many times in your word to not fear. Dear Lord, we claim victory over these three things in that we get that you are going to give us what we need to help those in need with this issue. But Lord, please don't let us hesitate. When we have a chance to help someone in need, let us rise up. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, I know it's been a busy day. We've had, um, but uh, we're in a home stretch now, so if you would, continue to bear with me. I was talking with folks yesterday, and I described the busy day and all the things we're going to have. And it was a narrow boat, but we voted against charging extra for you to come today. So you got some. <laughs> John 20, 24 through 21. Jesus appears to Thomas. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and I put my fingers where the nails were, and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. <coughs> Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Doubt and Thomas, that's what we call him, right? That's the label that was assigned to him. As so many of the other disciples and, and men and women of God, they were given certain labels. And I can see Thomas claiming it. I mentioned earlier in teaching on Thomas, I don't blame him for not doubting. He, they, these disciples were putting their lives on the line. Within the next couple months, a couple of them would already be put to death. And if I didn't see it, I don't know if I'd be willing to go out there and put my life on the line either. I worked with these disciples. I know what they're like. They're a bunch of doofuses. They're fishermen. They're dishonest tax collectors. They're crazy assassinating zealots. I'm going to just say, I'm going to put my life on the line based on their word? No, I want to see this myself. Thomas wasn't the only disciple who doubted Jesus' resurrection. They all doubted it. So why was Thomas branded the doubter? And what difference can that make to us? You see, years ago, there were two guys, and they went for a drive out in the country. One guy's name was Walter, and he was sharing a dream with his friend Art. And as they drove, they drove off the main road through a grove of trees into a real large expense, expanse of land. And Walter said he had a dream for what he could do for this land and that he planned to develop a family attraction there. But that venture would use all of his money and he told Art that the land on which they were standing bordered up the proposed building site. And he asked Art, look, I want you to buy all the adjacent land and help me develop because this value of this land is going to go crazy just a little bit of time. But Art's response was doubt disbelief, and he told Walter, you are crazy. Why would anybody drive for miles from the city to this middle of nowhere, and there was no way I'm dropping all my life savings on a crazy dream like that? And that was how Art, Art Linkletter, a very prominent TV personality of the day, that is how he turned down Walt Disney when he was offered the opportunity to buy up all the land surrounding Disney World. Doubt costs Art Linkletter a fortune. And the Bible warns us that we have to be careful. 
Because doubt can cost us a great deal as well. In the book of James, we're talking about getting inconvenient to our lives today. We're going to James. James 1, 5 through 8. And he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. You see, doubt can be a dangerous thing. I heard the story of a man who fell off of a cliff. And he's, he's hanging, and he's got a hold of this scrub tree. And it's, it's in there pretty good. It's holding. And he's yelling for help. Help. And he hears a voice that says, You want my help? And he goes, Yeah, I need your help. Who are you? He says, I'm God. He says, God, pull me up. Save me. I says, All right. He said, I will. Let go of the branch. Oh, and he pauses for a minute. He says, Is there anybody else up there? Doubt. That brings us to this disciple we're talking about today, the guy we know as Doubting Thomas. And I'm not sure when he started calling him this, but one source noted that as early as the 6th century, artwork began to portray what became known as the incredulity, or the doubt of Thomas. Now of late, there's been those who thought this labeling of doubt has been unfair to Thomas. One person said, in the end, the nickname Doubting Thomas is a rather unfortunate one. It's true that Thomas demanded evidence of Christ's resurrection before he accepted the truth. And doubt factored into his response to his friends. But it was not the defining quality of his life. Thomas should be better known for his loyalty, his obedience to the gospel, and to his faith. In other words, it's time for us to start cutting Thomas some, some slack here. Because he did accept the truth of the resurrection after doubting for a little bit. And if you'll notice the way the Bible was constructed, the whole way the Christian walk is constructed, that we almost need a little bit of doubt in our lives. I've talked to so many Christians who feel that they're not even saved because they have a little bit of doubt. And I've talked to Christians who would say, well, you know, I'm not a stronger Christian because I question God. Who am I to question God? And my response to them, you're the one who gave you enough wisdom and the brains to use to question him. He doesn't mind answering you. He will be glad to answer you. Of course we have a little bit of doubt. I don't think there's anything more dangerous than blind faith, to be honest with you. Because blind faith is the kind of faith that causes people to drive airplanes into buildings. You want to talk about blind faith? You know one of the hijackers on 9-11? They lost his luggage. Imagine that. Right? Yes. His luggage never made it to the plane. So when that was discovered, the FBI was all, they were all excited. We are going to get some information. We are going to get intelligence. What are we going to find? Hopefully there's a tablet or laptop. You know what they found in his luggage? Clothes. A wedding suit. Ooh, what? Wow. Complete. Completely laid out, everything, the shoes, the whole works. Because he was taught that if he died in jihad, he would receive, I don't know, some extraordinary number of number of uh, wives waiting for him in heaven. He believed that so much that he packed the clothes. That's faith. But it's blind faith. It's toxic faith. It's scary faith. It's faith where he was involved in a religion that did not allow him to learn about the God he was supposed to serve. It was faith in a religion that had him terrified that if he did anything wrong, that he would lose his place in heaven. It was a religion that taught him that, even more so, that he had to make up for what he had done. And the only way he could please this God was to kill a huge amount of non-believers and himself in the process. That's not the kind of faith God wants us to have in him. Amen. 
How do I say that? Why do I say that? What did Jesus say when he said to Thomas? When he came through the door, if you will. Did he say, what's the matter with you? I told you, how dare you doubt me? I'm the son of God. You're some lowly old fisherman and you have a nerve to doubt me? No, this was the son of God. This was it. This was the, the deity himself. And what does he say to this lowly fisherman that he created? He said, feel my hands. Here you go, look. Touch me. Feel the side. I have nothing to hide. Our God has nothing to hide from us. Amen. Amen. We can't be angry at atheists for questioning Christianity. We can't be angry when books like The Da Vinci Code and movies like The Last Temptation of Christ come up. We should be praising God for those kind of movies and books because that has prompted more conversation about the truth of the Bible than any, anything that's ever come out of any of our churches. I love when a non-believer comes up and says, how do you know this Da Vinci stuff isn't true? Ah, oh, Smalls, let me buy you a cup of coffee. Sit down. Let's talk. We would have never been able to have that conversation without that. Now, like I said, others have rightly doubted that Thomas wasn't the only one who doubted the resurrection of Christ. When the women reported to the disciples that Jesus had risen, it says in Luke 24, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, and the other women with whom who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed like an idle tale, and they did not believe them. We don't hear doubting Peter, though, do we? We don't hear doubting John. But they all doubted. And later we're told that Jesus stood among them, the disciples, and he said, Peace to you. And they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, and you see that I have. And when he had said that, he showed them his hands and his feet. So, Thomas isn't the only one who doubted. These other guys, they got to see Jesus first, so they believed. And like I said earlier, this bunch of misfits that Jesus made into disciples and they became apostles and the founders of the church, if I were one of them, I wouldn't believe the other ones either. You see, Thomas wasn't the only one who wanted to see the hands and feet. Here in Luke, all the disciples, they all needed to see these nail prints in order to deal with their doubts. Thomas wasn't the only one who doubted. They all did. Any one of us in this room, when we have those occasional doubts, we are not to beat ourselves up for them. We are not to say that doesn't mean we're no longer Christians because I doubt. It just means, you know, we, we just need another shot of faith. We need to open our eyes and see God do something in our lives in such a way that they can restore where we're doing Satan loves to whisper those little doubts in our ears. He loves to throw us off. He loves to make us think we can't do what God wants us to do. That little church in West Mifflin, they can't survive COVID. <laughs> they can't come back again. Sure. They can't have VBS one day a year and still reach kids. All those little doubts. He loves to whisper them in our ears. <coughs> but it's those little doubts that give God another opportunity to prove himself to us. Amen. And we end up stronger than we were in the first place. Amen. Amen. But going back to Thomas, he doubted, right? But they all doubted. So why did Thomas get all this attention? I think he deserved the attention. Because I don't think it was so much about his doubt as the way he expressed his doubt. And it was because of the way he expressed it that earned him that label, Doubting Thomas. But before we get to that, we have to understand that Thomas and the rest of the disciples, they should have known that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. Why should they have known that? He, said he told them over and over and over again. Pretty much everyone in this room has raised children. 
I watched Amanda yesterday, a wonderful job. Trying to keep track of two kids in and, and help out with VBS the way she did. It was beautiful. But I heard her at one point, she said to little Mackenzie, I've told you this before. <laughs> we all did that to our kids. We say, oh, have I not I told you this already? How many times have I told you? This was Jesus and the disciples. He had told them over and over again. I'm going to be put to death. I'm going to die. And I thought, but I'll be back. I will rise after three days. In Matthew 16, 21, it said, And Peter made the good confession that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And if you don't think they were paying attention, Peter argues with them about it. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. They knew. They were taught this. They learned it to the point where Peter actually engaged with Jesus about this topic and argued with him. Mark 9, 31 and 32 says, He was teaching his disciples, saying to them, Okay, so maybe he's a little unclear in the way he put this. Tell me if you would have got it. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed after three days, he will rise. And a little ambiguous, right? It could be seen a couple of different ways. That was pretty clear, right? Because he knew that these were basically, you know, these weren't the brightest people he was talking to. So he had to be very clear. And he was. And then in Luke 18, 31 and 34, taking the 12, he said to them, See, we are going to Jerusalem. And this is right before it happened. We are going to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. He will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. Time after time after time, Jesus drove this point home to these apostles, these disciples. I'm, I will die, and after three days, I will come back. They should have known it. They should have expected it. And, and it's interesting, all three of the passages we just looked at, the disciples are described as struggling to understand what Jesus had said. In Matthew 16, Jesus told him he could kill and rise from the dead. And Peter argued with him about it. And Peter caught the part where Jesus would die, but not the part where he said he'd rise from the dead. This is Peter. This is the water walker. Come on. This is the, the sword waving guy. This is, you know, this is the man. And he didn't get it. We're told that they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask. Remember when I was talking about blind faith and not I'm talking about not questioning God? Maybe if they would have asked him to explain it a little bit more, maybe they would have got it. Maybe they would have spared themselves that misery of, you know, Friday night, Saturday, all night, Saturday night, leading into the resurrection Sunday morning. If you are doubting, if you have something on your heart that you don't get, talk to another brother and sister about it. Pray about it together. Get into your word. Study. But don't be ashamed that you have doubts. None of us in this room will ever be a person of God like Thomas. But yet he's got the label, right? He doubted. Peter doubted. All the disciples, are we any better than them? No way. Huh, of course not. It's a blessing, baptizing Kirk today. You know, but I didn't have to struggle to stay on the water surface when I got in there, right? I knew I was going to sink when I stepped into that water. None of us, but Peter did. So if I have a few doubts now and again, I'm comforted by the fact that Peter did as well. Maybe they heard what they said, what he said, but they didn't connect the dots. They heard what he, that he was going to die, but not that he'd rise from the dead. At least that's what Thomas heard. 
When Jesus told his disciples that he was going to Lazarus to the home after Lazarus was dead and buried, Thomas sensed the danger, and he knew that he shouldn't go. Those are where the leaders want to kill Jesus. Jesus, I mean, we are like, we're loved all over Capernaum. They just love us. We're, they think we're the coolest guys. They, they bring us loaves and fishes, you know. They, they bring us water and we turn it into wine. We have a good life here. There's only one place we can't go, and that's Jerusalem. Why do you want to go there? He knew it was dangerous, and, but he knew Jesus was the boss. And if he wanted to go there, in John eleven sixteen, and Thomas said, let us also go that we may die with him. So he understood that Jesus would die, but he didn't get to coming back to life part. Even after he watched Lazarus come out of the tomb, he still didn't get that. None of the disciples believed that Jesus would rise from the dead either. It wasn't just Thomas. They all doubted that. So why does he get the label? Why is he doubting Thomas? Going back to what I said earlier, I don't think it was because of his doubt, but because of what he said. He had the courage to come right up and say, I'm not buying it until I see those holes in his hands. None of the other disciples said anything like that. They all doubted that they were not so brazen as to speak out and say, I will never believe. But Thomas did. He said, I'm not, I'm not going to believe you guys. I mentioned Peter. I mentioned walking on the water. What a tremendous act of faith that was on his part. I remember it wasn't a real long stroll, was it? He saw the wind. He saw the waves. And what happened to him? He started to sink, right? And as Jesus reached out his hand to pull Peter from the water, he asked him, I have trained you more thoroughly than that. You should have relied on the training that I gave you to keep from sinking, right? Not quite. Not quite what he said, was it? He said, oh, you of little faith. Why do you doubt? And I read that and I started to think, why do people doubt? And I come to the conclusion that there's two reasons. One is they refuse to believe. They consciously decided to not believe. And that's the first reason. For example, people refuse to believe because they have sin in their lives. I've talked to different people and I've dealt with things myself. I try to avoid those passages of the Bible that want me to give up the things that I really like. I've talked to people and said, well, is this, you know, I want to ask if this is a sin before I do it. And I said, it is. <laughs> and they'll say, I haven't told you what it is. And I say, you don't have to. Don't if you have to ask, you already know it's the answer. Talked to one lady one time and she was telling me about all these errors that she found in Scripture. I tried to explain why they weren't errors, but she continued to say she couldn't trust the Bible, so she doubted God. And then eventually she stopped coming to church altogether. And then later on we found out that it wasn't that she didn't believe the Bible, it's that she didn't want to change her life. She refused to believe in the trustworthiness of the Bible, because if we accept it as the unquestionable Word of God, we have to change. Amen. We have to repent of our sins. Not about. So, a lot of times people just refuse to trust God. They give up. They refuse to believe, and they let doubt take over. But that way they don't have to change your lifestyle. And another reason why people refuse to believe is because they trust something more than they trust God. They doubt because their friends say God can't do certain things. They doubt because science says God can't do certain things. There's a fairly famous Christian speaker I like to listen to. Very intelligent, easy to understand. I like the guy. It's not you, Spike. Sorry. But, <laughs> But I was shocked because one day I heard him refuse to say a certain miracle in Scripture he didn't believe because it defied the laws of physics. Well, I took two problems out of that statement. One, he was saying that science or physics has greater authority for him than God in his word. And second, he ignored the fact that every miracle in the Bible defied the laws of science. 
including the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Dead people stay dead. They don't come back to life. That's what science tells you. I'm sure that people rising from the dead after three days violate some specific law of science. I don't know what specific one that is, but I'm sure it's in there somewhere. This man doubted because he trusted science more than God. Other people refuse to believe because they trust that a small God. Their God fits in a little box. And when they want to do something that he doesn't like, they just keep the box shut. <laughs> they don't believe he can do much because he has to fit in that box. Their God can't do miracles. Their God can't protect his Bible. Their God doesn't intervene on behalf of his people. They have a little God who lives in a little box. And they doubt God because they don't think he could do anything to begin with. That was Thomas's problem. His God was too small to raise Jesus from the dead, so Thomas refused to believe. He doubted because he served a little God. By contrast, there are people who have a big God. He speaks and it's done. He commands and it happens. He knows how to show himself strong on behalf of those who fear him. People with a big God, they aren't crippled with doubts because their God is too big for them. And when those little doubts occur, it just leads them into a stronger walk with Him. Some people believe, or some people doubt God because they've already decided to refuse to believe, either because of their sin, or they, because they, they trust something more than they trust God and His Word, or they like a God that they can put in a little box. And these choices can be very dangerous. They can rob people of blessings that they would have had otherwise. Someone once said, pray, believe, and receive, or pray, doubt, and do without. What about the rest of us? What about those of us who, who never think of refusing to believe God, but still struggle with these doubts? Peter walked on the water, right? Jesus rebuked him for his doubt. But why did Peter doubt? It wasn't because he refused to believe. It was because he took his eyes off of Jesus. And when he quit looking at Jesus, he saw the wind, he saw the waves, and then he started to doubt, and he started to fear. And that's one of the worst things that cripples human beings. When his faith died within him, he started to sink beneath the waves. Now what it tells me is this, there is a way to protect myself against doubt and fear. And that is focus on Jesus. Amen. If I want to have a strong faith, one that isn't crippled by doubt and fear, I need to focus on Christ. And that is what changed things for Thomas. His doubt turned to faith. He looked at Jesus and he declared, my Lord and my God. And he was, at that point, he marched off and began a ministry that he eventually gave his life for. Without doubt, without fear, without hesitation. I saw a meme on Facebook and it said, here's my list of reasons why I'm not panicking about what's going on in the world right now. One, Jesus. That was it. Amen. One of the most comforting stories I ever heard about Jesus. So, comes out of Mark 9. My father came to Jesus and asked him to heal his son. And he says to Jesus, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Amen. Amen. Amen, brother. And immediately the, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. And Jesus healed the man's son. But why? Why would Jesus heal this boy? Because the guy had doubts. He came right out and said, If you can do something. And he even admitted, he said, help my unbelief. I want to, I want to believe. I want to believe this more than anything, but I'm struggling. Help me. In another part of the Gospels, we're told that in one town, Jesus couldn't do many miracles because of their unbelief. They had unbelief. The Father had unbelief. So what was different about this man that Jesus would heal his son? You see, the difference was that town, they had unbelief that refused to believe in Jesus. 
This father came to Christ and he knew that was his last hope. His only hope was Jesus. He wanted to believe. He hadn't closed his mind. He hadn't closed his heart. He had his doubts, but he remained focused on Jesus. Because it's only by looking to Jesus we can overcome our doubts, our fears, and receive the blessings God wants to give us. I like the word determination. To me, it's so much better than stubbornness. It's that determination to focus on Jesus that is the very first step toward living a life that pleases God. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this incredible day. Lord, being with one another and, and the things that we got to see today and be a part of, all of these things were worship to you, God. And we just thank you so much that even after yesterday and after today, Lord, we're still drawing closer to one another. We're drawing closer to you. And Lord, we pray for all of us at those times, Lord, when, when we allow Satan, when we allow his voice in our ear to take hold of our mind. God, we thank you for being a God who is patient with us, a God who is merciful to us, and a God who will continue, continue to hold out his hand and say, here, Feel my hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.